Hello and welcome to this episode of Felonious, a podcast where we discuss the realm of true crime. From chilling cold cases to the wild and wacky, we'll explore it all with a perfect blend of seriousness and humour. My name is Emma and I'm Nazia. To keep up to date with what's coming up, be sure to follow us on Instagram at felonious.pod and visit our website feloniouspod.com. We hope you enjoy this episode, so let's get to it. I probably, I, I'm really excited to do today's episode, but I'll probably struggle to think because it's so hot. Yeah, I don't blame you. I mean, it's not too bad here. It's about 22 degrees, but it's it's cooled down because the sun's set. I'm jealous. It's 35 degrees every day this week. And it's like, at first it was okay, but now it's just kind of getting to me. I'm losing my tolerance for it. Yeah, you want to move up north. Yeah. It never gets to 35 degrees here. (laughs) I know, but I mean, the good thing about this weather is my in-laws have, it's like a temporary swimming pool, so. Oh, okay. I didn't realise it was temporary. It looked like a a proper... No, it's like you dismantle it when you're done with it. You just let all the water out and you just... I'll send you a proper picture, but... I don't know, this sounds so, I don't know if this is a norm in many other countries, but at least in France, they sell a lot of like inflatable, giant inflatable, or this one's not inflatable, it's just like tarp material, that swimming pool appropriate, and it's around a metal frame. So you assemble it when you want to use it, spend about two days filling it up, and then you enjoy it for the summer. Given that the planet's burning, We've got extra days to enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, you'll be swimming around in winter by the sounds of it. Well, isn't like a British summertime, I was, you know, like how on Instagram people are complaining about how hot it is and whatnot. And I saw someone post something like, well, actually the official end of summer is something like mid-September. Yeah, I think they here they class autumn as like when it drops to 10 degrees or lower. Oh, really? Wow. That's like winter everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, it's just weird because we're three months away from Christmas. Oh, God. Yeah. And, but, you know, people are getting geared up for Halloween if they're into that sort of thing. And that's next next month. God, yeah. But we're too busy... <sighs> getting burnt in 35 degrees heat wave. Yeah, that's mad. It is a bit. I do remember one time I was living in London and we were sitting in the park and it was 30 degrees and it was the day after Halloween because we had these Halloween um, chocolate log uh, sweets. I'm trying to remember that. Oh my God, that must have been ages ago. It was a few years ago, yeah. We were just... Eating Halloween sweets in the park. Yeah. On on the 1st of November. <laughs> I don't know if it was last last year or the year before, but on New Year's Day, it was so warm. Alex and I hung our washing, our laundry outside because it was that sunny and warm on the 1st of, of January. <laughs> so that, that's one of the things I'm looking forward to in, in getting a house is hanging washing outside. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. (laughs) I'm such an adult. Oh, I'll tell you one thing about being an adult. I defrosted my freezer this week. But anyway, going back to laundry. Yeah, oh my God. In the summer, it's the best because you can do like three washes in a day and it all dries within two hours. It's great. Whereas in the winter, especially if you live in an apartment or in the winter, we obviously hang our washing indoors and it takes like three days for everything to dry. And winter clothes are thick. So you just get the smell of damp everywhere. (laughs) Yeah, that's nasty. But yeah, no, I I, I defrosted my freezer this week. So I think that's like the most adult thing I've done this week. Apart from taking care of my child. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like keeping her alive, number one. Yeah. Number two, defrosting my freezer. And it's made so much space. So... Anyone anyone out there who hasn't adulted enough to defrost 
their freezer, I highly recommend it. It's hard work, but it's very satisfying. Yeah, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not adulting hard enough. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I don't know, we shouldn't judge our our listeners. (laughs) Oh, that's true, yeah. We love you, really. But my advice to anyone... Anyone who's who who's preparing to leave their parents, oh no, even if you live with your parents still, help them out and defrost the freezer. You know, it's your responsibility just as much as theirs. But if, if you live in a house or an apartment, defrost your freezer. Or get a frost-free one. No one's judging you. Do they exist? Oh my God, Nazia, you're not adulting enough. No. <laughs> I'm still stuck in the times where we have to defrost our freezer. <laughs> Is that why we keep on focusing on 70s true crime? Maybe. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's no technology involved, high-tech technology involved in, in those crimes. So it's more aligned with us. <laughs> <laughs> Technophobes. We weren't even born in the 70s. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, what have you found this week? Because last week it was dogs. Yes. It's not dogs this week. Oh, you're going to love this one. It's related to us. Oh, God. Okay. Go on. Stolen circumcision ambulance found after tip-off. What? Yeah. What? Can you repeat that? Or clarify? (laughs) Stolen circumcision ambulance found after tip-off. And what does that have to do with us? (laughs) A circumcision ambulance stolen in a violent carjacking has been found in a pub car park in East London. Not embarking. The distinctive vehicle, an Audi TT, was taken in a robbery in Barking. No. As the owner left a patient's house on Alderman Avenue at about 5.15pm Wednesday. This is in 2015. What were you doing finding articles like that? (laughs) I'm joking. You don't have to say. Surely the question should be, how is a circumcision ambulance a thing? And why would someone steal it? Yeah, that's what makes it a circumcision. I don't want to Google search this because I don't want this in my on my Google records. But what would make it a circumcision ambulance? Is it part of a certain... You know, like certain religious practices. I don't know. I have no idea. And the fact that it's embarking, it actually doesn't surprise me. No, it really doesn't. Which pub was it? Does it say? No, it does not. Because they're they're getting rid of one of the pubs embarking. They've gotten rid of it, haven't they? Oh, yeah, they have gotten rid of it. I mean, it was a dive, but it's still a bit sad. It is. Yeah. Because you had, the, you've got, you, you, you still got one of them, but you had the two pubs and they were opposite each other. Yeah, right next to the tube station as well. Yeah, and that was like, I don't know, that was just a bit of barking. And pubs, you know, they're like nice buildings, aren't they, generally? Yeah, I don't know about this one though. No one ever went in. <laughs> no one. Because <laughs> we, we all went to the nicer one. They were opposite ends of the spectrum. Nicer is like... Mm, that's a strong word (laughs) (laughs) putting it yeah politely wow you'll have to send me that article i will but they they found the ambulance yeah and they they found it outside another pub in newham okay that's like five kilometers down the road and the spokeswoman for the pub declined to name the venue for operational reasons fair enough they don't want to be known as the circumcision ambulance pub who knows very bizarre it was used by a home circumcision service so it must have been some a religious thing yeah possibly i mean it's decked out like a an ambulance like in uk ambulance colors it's got a medical response on the doors an emergency ambulance at the the bottom of the doors it's it's just funny how it's an Audi TT. Yeah. <laughs> and its sole purpose is to help perform circumcisions. Yeah. Strange. Anyway, that was my my find for this week. Ooh, I don't want to be thinking about circumcisions right now. 
not discriminating against anyone who's had one. It's just the process and the fact that many babies and young children have it done without, well, they can't consent, but it's kind of, it's, it's a bit of a touchy topic, that, isn't it? Yeah, but I thought it was funny. The, the article's funny. The fact that an Audi TT... It's got blue lights on it as well. Is that legal? It must be. Because can they be accused of, like, impersonating an actual ambulance? Well, it is an ambulance in that situation, isn't it? I suppose. How do you qualify to become a... What do you call them? Cir- circumciser? <laughs> I have no idea. This is sending my mind down a rabbit hole. That yeah. I'm not sure. And also, they must get paid quite well to afford an Audi TT. Yeah, it's a £40,000 car. Yeah. <laughs> Should we get on with the episode? Yeah, I think we need to get off this topic now. <laughs> I'll still read the article later. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'll bring my thoughts back next time, or maybe we'll, I'll, I'd have forgotten about it then, because you'd have found something even more obscure and funny. Disturbing. <laughs> 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 so, today's episode... Oh no, we need to recap last week. Yeah, don't get ahead of yourself. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I'm just so excited about today's episode. Oh, I thought it was um, about the circumcision, but okay. No, <laughs> I mean, if listeners, if you want any episodes... Oh no. No, 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 no. Scrap that. <laughs> I was going to say, if listeners want to hear any crimes about regarding... No, I don't want to know. <laughs> don't think I want to research any crimes to do with circumcision. Right. Last week's episode. Yeah. So last week we were we were still in the 70s and still in Stockholm. And what happened in Stockholm? There was a bank robbery. Yeah. A six-day hostage situation. Yeah. And it was 50 years ago. Yes. So when we recorded, it was on the month because we recorded in August. Yeah. Now it's September. Yeah, now it's September. But yeah... Six days, those individuals were stuck in a bank, and they were mostly confined to the vaults, weren't they? Yeah. So the Yana, who organised the whole thing, uh, wanted to get his uh, friend Clark Olofsson out of jail, and he succeeded in getting the police to get Clark to the bank. And they were after money and a getaway vehicle, and they wanted to take the hostages with them, didn't they? Yeah. So they. Ended up sending, letting most of the hostages out, but kept three women and one guy. Yeah. I should have a better memory of this because I just edited it this afternoon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you had a much better time at pronouncing names than I did. Oh, yeah. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll hear that, listeners, if you haven't already listened to the episode. Please go back and um, give it a listen. Let's not cover another Scandinavian case oh we're going to (laughs) oh no we are aren't we yeah there's danish ones there's norwegian ones there's swedish ones it's gonna be great (sighs) sorry listeners (laughs) but no if if you haven't listened to it yet please go back because it leads very nicely on to this week's episode so today we are bringing you another story from the 70s we Just can't seem to escape this era. And we will be talking about the case of Patricia Hurst, aka Patty, who was a wealthy American heiress of a media empire. And she was kidnapped by the Symbionese Liberation Army, who were a far left militant organization. Now, I know in our introduction, we say that we'll mostly cover cases outside of the UK and the US. And this one, is in the US, but we couldn't resist it, especially given the comparison to the bank robbery in Stockholm, which we covered last week, and the debates around Patty Hurst's innocence. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to this one. Yeah. So this one, there's a lot of violence. There is. There's a lot of guns. Yep. Mention of bombs, mention of murder. And there's also the mention of rape and sexual violence. 
And there's lots of names and nicknames and yeah, I've I've tried to keep the nicknames out of the notes in our discussion, but we will have them on the names list. So we're going to have a names list like we did for the Charles Sabraj case, aren't we? Yeah, because if you're like us, you're going to need it. The research for this was taken from two documentaries. The first one is called Gorilla: The Taking of Patty Hearst. And then the second one was the, it was a CNN documentary called The Radical Story of Patty Hearst. And the CNN one was really, really informative. And we'll probably comment on that throughout. But our discussions are going to have, it's going to pull information from both of those. So, should we get stuck in? Yeah, let's begin. Okay, so a bit of background. So during the 1970s, there were a lot of young Americans who were wanting a better future. From the 1960s, there were the civil rights movements and the anti-war movements. There were lots of protests, some which were handled violently by the police. One example was the Kent State protest in 1970, where students were protesting peacefully and the police just opened fire. And they shot and killed four unarmed students and injured nine others. One of the characters who we'll talk about in depth is Bill Harris. And he does a lot of the talking in the CNN documentary. So Bill Harris, he had been to Vietnam during the war and he witnessed a lot of Vietnamese people being tortured. And that changed his way of thinking. And then when he came back to America, he met Emily, who he marries later on. So they met in 1968. They married in 1971. And during their relationship, Emily also became more political. They both wanted to be involved in political work. So Bill linked up with an old college friend, Angela Atwood. They then met Joe Romero, who invited them to a community meeting. And Bill, Emily and Joe, they then met Russ Little and Willie Wolf after watching a movie about Che Guevara. Willie was studying anthropology at the time and he started to visit prisons. Russ joined him on the prison visits and they recognised how unfairly black people were imprisoned as they weren't given the same opportunities in society. And They started discussing how to help them, not help them by helping to raise funds for their lawyer fees or, you know, anything like that. They thought about helping them by helping the prisoners escape. And at the same time, prison was seen as a place where they could spread their revolutionary ideas, which makes sense if you've got incarcerated people who have no chance in society anyway. It's the perfect breeding ground for revolutionary ideas and radical ideas. They then met a guy called Donald DeFries in Vacaville Prison. He was a black guy, he was married with children, and before being imprisoned, he had a full-time job. He had been to prison a number of times, but his most recent conviction landed him in there because he was caught trying to steal from a prostitute after beating her up. Nice. Yeah. At the time, The jobs in prisons were completed by inmates and DeFries knew that by working on the boilers meant that he would be working outside of the fence. So he volunteered on one occasion. And on the 5th of March in 1973, he used this opportunity to escape. He was then taken to the house of another person called Ms. Moon Soltisik. And then he was transferred to another person's house who is Nancy Ling Perry. And this was in Concord. And apparently this is when the SLA supposedly started. So already in that one short introduction, there's a lot of names. Yeah, I'm already confused and I know (laughs) the whole story. Yeah. (laughs) So after the group got together, they started to buy weapons and practiced shooting at gun ranges. On the 6th of November in 1973, in Oakland, California, the SLA murdered Marcus Foster, who was the first black school superintendent in Oakland. And 
A superintendent is a manager who oversees the day-to-day running of a school district. And the fact that he was the first black superintendent in Oakland, which was kind of obviously a big deal for that time. His deputy, Robert Blackburn, was also badly shot. Marcus Foster was also a controversial figure because he wanted police presence in schools and ID system for the students. And one of the reasons for this was to keep non-student drug dealers off the campus. But for the very left-wing students who were anti-police and anti-establishment, this would have been quite an unpopular proposal as well. Russ Little claims that it was Ms. Moon who shot Marcus Foster. Nancy Ling Perry was supposed to shoot Robert Blackburn, but she didn't succeed, so Donald DeFries shot him with a shotgun. Russ Little and Joe Romero, they were at the scene, but as lookouts. According to Russ Little, DeFries' reason for killing a black man was because he was the front man for some horrendous police apparatus that was set up. And people in the documentary, I can't remember which one it was now, but they were like saying it's bizarre for a black guy to shoot another black guy. Up until this point, Bill, Emily and Angela, they hadn't met DeFries, so they meet him after the murder of Marcus Foster. The SLA then sent a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle claiming that they had assassinated Foster and had used cyanide-tipped bullets. So until this point, no one knew who the SLA were, so this was kind of getting them... Notoriety. Yeah. So in January 1974, Russ Little and Joe Romero were stopped by a traffic cop. The police found SLA weapons and propaganda in their van. There was a shootout between Joe and the police officer. Joe had one of the weapons which was used to kill Marcus Foster, so they were both charged with the murder, even though, according to Russ Little, they were not the shooters. 48 hours later, they were in San Quentin prison. Joe Ramiro was considered as responsible for the weapons, while Russ Little was considered a logistical support person as he was close to DeFries. Investigators believed Little would have been aware of the decision to kill Marcus Foster. They were arrested near the safe house where DeFries, Ms. Moon and Nancy were staying. The trio abandoned the safe house, but before they did, they tried to set it on fire to hide any evidence. However, they failed and the police found the house with all of the SLA material as well as the weapons that were left behind. Investigators also found Russ Little's identification at the Concord location, as well as a map of the scene of the murder at the Oakland Public Schools with the location where Dr. Foster had been murdered. The map was identified by the word ambush written on top. During the search, police also found a list of potential kidnap victims. Patricia Hurst's name was on that list. Emily Harris had been working in the registrar's office at UC Berkeley, so the SLA had knowledge of who was at Berkeley, which helped inform their targets. The SLA also had Patricia's name from an engagement announcement in a local paper where her and her fiancé Stephen Weed announced their engagement. They decided to kidnap Patricia in response to the imprisonment of Russ Little and Joe Romero. So, Patricia Hurst, who is she? Patricia Hurst, she's the daughter of Randolph Hurst, who is a newspaper executive, and the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, that's not confusing, (laughs) who was a businessman, a newspaper publisher, and politician. She was a University of California sophomore. The Hearsts were amongst the richest and most powerful families in the United States. Patty met her fiancé Stephen Weed when she was about 15 or 16 years old, and he was 23. Stephen was working at a girls' school at the time, teaching maths and geometry. Patricia went to the guitar lessons he was giving, and apparently she pursued him, not the other way around. Yeah, that's still a bit weird though, isn't it? Yeah, but then you'll see there's allusions to maybe that being true, given her behaviour later on, which we'll go on about yeah. <laughs> later. <laughs> so she moved in with Stephen when she was 18 years old. According to Stephen, Patricia had a problematic relationship with her mother who wanted to lead her sort of life. Um, So I think her mother was like, just, she was very ladylike. Very traditional. Yeah, very traditional, old values. 
whereas Patricia liked doing things with her dad more, apparently, according to her fiancé, Stephen. But this relationship with her mum is a bit important later on. A few days before her kidnapping, Stephen and Patricia did have a couple knock on their door, asking about rentals, which seemed suspicious but not worrying at the time. In hindsight, Stephen wondered if it was the SLA checking in on them before the kidnapping. So on the 4th of February 1974, while Stephen and Patricia were having dinner in their apartment, Angela Atwood knocked on their door asking to use their phone, alluding to an accident that had happened outside. A few seconds after, DeFries and Bill entered the apartment. Willie, Ms Moon, Emily and Camilla Hall, who was Ms Moon's lover, were outside in different vehicles. Angela went for Patricia and started to tie her up while Bill stood in the door with his machine gun to make sure no one left or came in. Because Patricia was wealthy, DeFries believed they had a safe in the apartment and demanded to know where it was. Stephen pleaded for them not to harm Patricia and him and that they could take whatever they wanted, not realising that they were there to kidnap Patricia. Stephen tried to run towards Bill, but Bill managed to knock him back with his gun. Then DeFries continued to beat Stephen up. Bill then carried a tied, gagged and blindfolded Patricia to the car. He had some trouble getting her into the trunk, which gave her an opportunity to shuffle back towards the garage, but then he managed to get her back again and proceeded to put her in the trunk. However, the commotion of all of this alerted some nearby neighbours. DeFries then came out and fired his weapon to keep any neighbours away. Nancy heard the shots from her vehicle and she fired her weapon too. As they were about to make the getaway, the police stopped Willie's car because he was driving with his lights off and just as the police call was coming in through the radio about Patricia's kidnapping, this police officer let the SLA members go so they were able to drive away taking Patricia with them. I bet that police officer felt like a right mug at that point. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I was going to say. He must have thought, oh, I could could have stopped all of this. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) Oh, dear. So after being discharged from the hospital, Stephen Weed made a statement to say that the SLA were very militaristic and they had planned the kidnapping so well that they needed to say almost nothing to each other. The police found the getaway car which was stolen and was abandoned after the kidnapping. They could tell the kidnapping was too well organised to be a spur-of-the-moment crime. The FBI became immediately involved after being contacted by Berkeley Police and they set up at the Hearst resident. On the 7th of February, Randolph Hearst received a letter which he read out on the news and it was a letter from the SLA demanding that all communications be published in the newspaper and all other forms of media. They also threatened the execution of Patricia if the authorities made any attempts to arrest them or rescue Patricia and they signed the letter off with capitals saying, death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. At this point, Russ Little and Joe Ramirez had become the public faces for the SLA, and they were put on death row and tortured in prison, but they hadn't even been brought to trial yet. I can't believe that they were able to put them on death row without having a trial. Yeah, I mean, that's mentioned in the... um guerrilla documentary and I think it was Russ Little himself that says it I think but yeah it's a bit crazy but apparently you know they were tortured and in one of the communications from the SLA if I remember correctly they were saying you know we want proof that you're not mistreating like Russ and Joe in prison Mm. it's a bit it is a bit crazy and the fact that one of them is still in prison Joe Ramirez yeah So on the 11th of February 1974, the SLA demanded a prisoner swap. KPFA Radio broadcasted that they received a seven-page statement from the SLA and a tape recording from the SLA and Patricia Hurst. When they realised the prisoner exchange wasn't going to happen, they demanded that Randolph Hurst fed all the poor people in California $300 million worth of free food. This demand was the idea of Bill, Emily and Angela. A tape recording of Patricia Hurst is played on air. She says she is okay and that the SLA are willing to die for what they're doing. 
She hoped her father would meet their demands so she could be freed quickly. At this point, Patricia was being kept in a closet. The SLA wore ski masks, so she couldn't identify them. Otherwise, she was kept blindfolded. They did not intend to keep her for very long. Uh, going back to that radio broadcast, is that the one where I see it in one of the documentaries, but the, the guy is just sitting there with, in front of all of these microphones the, the press have put in front of him while he's reading out this statement from the SLA? Yes, I think so. It's just a strange sight because... Obviously, he's got his microphone for the radio. Yeah. And then you see like 10 other microphones surrounding him. Yeah. With other microphones coming from the other side of the screen, like to join in. And he's just reading this letter from the SLA. It's just really funny. It's, it's something you would expect today with all of these microphones, but not in the 1970s. Yeah. Randolph replied to the SLA's demands that they were impossible to meet and that he would come back with a counteroffer which would be acceptable, even though he had no one to negotiate with directly. De Vries, whose nickname was Sin-Q, released a statement that Patricia was arrested for the crimes of her family against the American people and oppressed people of the world. He described the Hearst Empire as fascist and ultra-right and one of the largest propaganda institutions of the present military dictatorship. He also stated he was willing to execute Patricia to save the life of men, women and children of every race. So much of the media were at the Hearst residence at this point, as they did not know where the SLA were, so they couldn't really camp up anywhere where they thought the SLA might be, because they had no clue. Yeah. So it, it got to the point where the media were having like barbecues, wine and liquor out on their front garden, basically, in front of the house. And they were just waiting for updates. Yeah, because it was a massive story, but no one knew who the SLA were, like who the other members of the SLA were. And I mean, I guess the Hearst, they had a big enough residence to accommodate everyone. <laughs> yeah, true. But probably not what they wanted, you know, all these jur journalists and news reporters camped out in there. <laughs> it's just the fact that Patty Hearst's mother actually comments, oh, you've, you've been so good, as if, like, the media have been so supportive and everything. Well, it's part of her biz her family business, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, true, yeah. <laughs> Keep it in the family, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the FBI started their investigation as a terrorist investigation and as a kidnapping investigation, but they had very little knowledge about the SLA. The SLA then announced they would stop the communication between Patricia and her family unless Russ Little and Joe Ramiro were allowed to communicate via live national TV to reveal the state of their physical health and conditions of their confinement. The SLA were telling Patricia that her parents, the police, and the FBI didn't care about her at all. They started gaining her trust, for example, when she didn't eat for the first couple of days, Angela would eat the food first to prove they weren't trying to poison her. They started educating her by giving her literature to read and recite. As the group was made up of five women and three men, the women started talking to Patricia about feminism and empowering women. As she's being fed the ideas of revolution, the problems with the upper class and about women's rights, the group's ideas could have seemed appealing to her. Another recording of Patricia was released where she said she was okay, and as a prisoner of war, she was being treated as such in accordance with international codes of war. She asked that everyone stopped acting as if she was dead, and that it was important to the SLA that she was returned safely. And her mother was dressed up all in black, wearing a black dress as if she was in mourning. Yeah, like in any of the conferences or news, uh, what do you call it? Broadcasts. Broadcasts, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, she'd be wearing black. So Patricia would be like, you're not at my funeral. 
Yeah, she kept on saying it's not really helping you wearing black. Yeah. (laughs) The SLA started training Patricia, teaching her how to use a shotgun so she could defend herself if needed. For example, if the police came in and tried to kill her too. Randolph Hearst made arrangements for $2 million to be delivered to a tax-exempt charity to distribute the funds to the poor and needy. Ludlow Kramer, who was the Secretary of State of the State of Washington, was assigned as the coordinator. A private volunteer organisation with 4,000 volunteers was set up to help meet the SLA demands to help the poor, the largest ever in the US. Ronald Reagan, who was Governor of California at the time, apparently commented that he hoped that anyone who took the food from the programme got botulism. It's nice, isn't it? Isn't it just? Due to the lack of coordination, in some areas violence broke out between people and police. On television, it was broadcast that food was being thrown from the trucks to people in line. Riots then broke out. And you could see footage of this in the documentaries and it's crazy. Yeah, it's really insulting as well. Like you give these people hope. And then you're just treating like maybe it was just lack of coordination or whatever, but the the disrespect of just having food thrown. Yeah, literally chucking it from the, it was a lorry that the food was in and people were on top of this lorry just chucking stuff at these people who were desperate for, for food. Yeah, it's just evil, I thought. Yeah, yeah, it really was. As a result, the Attorney General of the State of California declared that any crime linked to the kidnapping would be prosecuted, including the food distribution programs. The SLA allowed Patricia to watch news coverage surrounding her kidnapping on TV, so she was not kept in the dark. The SLA demanded $4 million more from the Hearst for the food programs within 24 hours, to which Randolph responded, The size of the latest demand of the SLA is far beyond my financial capability. Therefore, the matter is now out of my hands. Randolph's father, William Randolph Hearst, had set up his company so the money was managed by professionals and not his sons. This meant Randolph had to go to these managers to access the kind of money the SLA were demanding. After his latest statement on TV, Patricia felt abandoned by her father. A recording from Patricia is released where she accused her parents of making a disaster of the food programs, providing poor quality food and then washing their hands of it, even though they did have enough money needed to meet the SLA demands. It's a bit of a tricky situation that, because obviously they are one of the wealthiest like families and... Randolph obviously wants to save his do- his daughter, but these business partners don't want to hurt the reputation of the company by giving in to their demands. According to Bill, Willie started talking to Patricia as a peer rather than a kidnapper. He and Patricia had more in common in terms of class backgrounds, and he told her why he joined the SLA and shared books with her. Angela asked one day if Patricia wanted to have sex with anyone in the group, to whom she answered Willie. Initially, the group did not agree that Patricia should sleep with anyone. They weren't a a monogamous group at all, they were all sleeping with each other. Yeah, they were in open relationships. In the end, they agreed to let Willie and Patricia have more privacy. However, according to Patricia, she says she was tortured and raped by her captors. Her fiancé suggests before her kidnapping, Patricia didn't really have a political view, but now she might, and it was unavoidable. Meanwhile, Patricia's family were desperate to find her to the point that they hired psychics to help them, which obviously didn't work. At the same time, Catherine Hurst was reappointed by Ronald Reagan as a member of the University of California Board of Regents. The regents did not agree with the free speech movement, especially among students. Her reappointment as a regent was in defiance to the SLA, but this further alienated Patricia from her family. The Board of Regents is an 
an independent governing body which oversees the state's colleges and universities. So they decide education fees and the welfare and conduct of students. The SLA moved from a three-bedroom house in the suburbs to a studio apartment that was on the same street as the FBI office. So, yeah, just going back to her mum, like where we said earlier, she didn't have a great relationship with her mum. And I think this emphasised that even more, like the fact that her mum would do something that could, like, to defy the SLA. Yeah, that, that could make things worse. Yeah, that could, ha- you know, that could have potentially put her daughter in more danger. On the 3rd of April 1974, Patricia demanded her parents to tell the poor and oppressed people of this nation what the corporate state is about to do, warn black and poor people that they are about to be murdered down to the last man, woman and child, tell the people that the energy crisis is nothing more than a means to get public approval for a massive programme to build nuclear power plants all over the nation, tell the people that the entire corporate state is with the aid of this massive power supply, about to totally automate the entire industrial state to the point that in the next five years, all that will be needed is a small class of button pushers. Tell the people, Dad, that the removal of expendable excess, the removal of unneeded people, has already started. Oof, it's deep. Yep. She goes on to say she has been given two choices. One to be released in a safe area, or two, to join forces with the SLA. She chooses the latter and announces that she has been given the name Tanya after a comrade who fought alongside Che Guevara. After she was accepted into the SLA as a comrade, Willie gifted her an artefact from Mexico which she wore around her neck, and this will pop up again later as well. After this, it was suggested that Patricia had been brainwashed and her case was an example of Stockholm Syndrome. On the 15th of April 1974, nine members of the SLA robbed the Hibernia Bank at 9.40am and stole $10,960 in cash. The bank robbery was planned because A. The SLA wanted to prove that Patricia had joined them and B. They needed money. Patricia was armed with an M1 carbine, which she had been trained to use. Bill, Willie and Emily waited outside. DeFries disarmed the security guard. Ms Moon emptied the tills while everyone else made sure other victims kept their heads down. According to a recording by DeFries, two civilians were shot because they did not listen to or hear orders from the SLA. Patricia was named in a federal warrant charging her with being a material witness to the bank robbery. Dan Grove took the security tape from the bank to the Berkeley School for the Deaf so they could lip-read Patricia on the tape. They interpreted her to have said, I'm Tanya, up, up, up against the wall, motherfucker. After seeing her mother on TV saying that her daughter was still a kidnap victim and a victim of thought control, Patricia recorded another message to say the bank robbery forced the corporate state to help finance the revolution. She also calls the theories of her being brainwashed ridiculous, to the point of being beyond belief, and declares herself a soldier of the People's Army. The SLA were trying to figure out what to do next, as they didn't have many resources and were wanted by the police. At the same time, the zebra murders were taking place, where a group of black serial killers were targeting white victims. Black men were being stopped and searched in the street in an attempt to find the perpetrators so DeFries couldn't risk being outside. According to Bill, the SLA made the decision to relocate and suggested to Patricia that she went back home, but she didn't want to. They decided to split the group as it was too much to have nine people living together. Emily, Bill and Patricia stuck together while the other six stayed as a group and they all relocated to Los Angeles. The FBI raided an apartment which had been abandoned the previous week. They found slogans written on the walls by DeFries and Patricia. There was even a message for the FBI including, Happy hunting, Charles. I think Charles was one of the um, FBI investigators. Yeah, sounds like it. (laughs) So on the 16th of May 1974, 
Bill, Emily and Patricia went to a Mel's sporting goods shop. Patricia was left in the VW van with the keys, weapons and ammunition. According to the Gorilla documentary, it said that Bill Harris tried to shoplift some socks. But according to Bill himself in the CNN documentary, there was a misunderstanding where he picked up a gun that he contemplated buying, but he changed his mind and put it back. So a shop employee, they didn't see him putting the gun back, so they thought he had stolen it. When he and Emily tried to leave, the employee confronted Bill and a scuffle ensued. Patricia saw the scuffle and she started to fire shots from the van. The three of them escaped in the VW van. They then stole a car from someone else under gunpoint. However, that car broke down. They then approached two other men and Bill just went up to them, according to him, and said that they were the SLA. So the men allowed the three members to use their car. It was now unsafe for them to go back to the safe house. So the trio carried on to kind of make their escape, I guess. And they found a young guy called Tom Matthews, who was an 18-year-old selling his van. At first, Emily asked to test drive the van and Tom hopped in the passenger seat with her. She then asked if her friends could join. Bill then told Tom that they were with the SLA and that they needed to borrow his van. They were friendly with Tom and Patricia opened up to him. And these are, this is from Tom himself. He speaks about this encounter in the CNN documentary. And Tom even sawed off the handcuff that was still attached to Bill's wrist from the store altercation. The SLA had various rendezvous points around LA and the trio went to a drive-in which was one of these meeting points. The other six saw the news reports about the sporting goods store and realised that they were no longer safe and that the police would know that they were in LA. So they found a new safe house a few miles away. When the others realised, so Bill, Emily and Patricia, when they realised that DeFries and the other five weren't coming, they decided to drive to the hills. However, they realised they had left a parking ticket behind, which connected them to the street that the house was on. Big fuck up moment there. <laughs> the FBI and the SWAT team went to the original safe house, which they found from this parking ticket, and found it to be empty with ammunition and literature left behind. Bill, Emily and Patricia then stole a Cadillac and moved on from their location. They gave Tom Matthews back the keys to his van before leaving him. When they found out that the original safe house was found by police, they decided to go to Disneyland. Not to go on Hyperspace Mountain, by the way. They wanted to recruit Goofy. Yeah, <laughs> Goofy and um, Donald Duck. So on the 17th of May, the LAPD took the lead and were gathering information from witnesses. They swarmed the whole area in the hope of trapping the group. An elderly lady approached a patrol perimeter unit and informed them that the SLA was staying in her daughter-in-law's house. When the SWAT team approached the house, DeFries could be heard ordering the others to barricade it. The houses surrounding the location were evacuated and 19 SWAT officers were surrounding the safe house and there were also snipers. I think it's important to mention that, according to the documentary, the SWAT team, they were quite a new unit. And I think if it wasn't the first, this was one of their first big operations. So meanwhile, Bill, Emily and Patricia, they were watching live news coverage of the raid from their hiding place near Disneyland. And the whole nation was watching and, you know, it was being broadcast live. So they were watching the shootout, and everyone believed that Patricia was in the house. And it was the first time, as I said, it was the first time that news was being broadcast live and on videotape rather than on film. So it's quite exciting. And it made me think of the Stockholm incident where everyone's just glued to their TV. Yeah. News is entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, in some cases. <laughs> The police and the SWAT team attempted to get the SLA members out of their hiding and, you know, in, you can see videos where they're just ordering them come out. They're not shooting first. And initially, a man and a young boy came out. The man lied and said that there was only a woman in the house, but then the boy said that there were people with guns and bullets inside. 
Then tear gas was thrown into the house to get the SLA to surrender. However, it ended up being a violent shootout, which was televised on national TV. And you can see videos of journalists on the scene yeah. And like one of them nearly gets his head, like he's, he's talking yeah. and a bullet just whooshes, like he could feel his hair. <laughs> yeah, but like seconds before that happened, he was actually asking a police officer in, yeah. in what direction the SLA was shooting. <laughs> it's like, we're shooting in this direction, yeah. mate. <laughs> they were like, oh shit, this is actually serious. Yeah. <laughs> So the police were outgunned by the SLA and the SLA had masks on, which meant that they withstood the tear gas chemicals. The building then ended up on fire and a black woman came out of the house and she surrendered, but she wasn't a member of the SLA. The SLA members kept shooting despite the fire. They moved into the crawl spaces and shot from there. Nancy eventually came out and she was armed and wearing a gas mask and she was shot instantly. Camilla Hall was also within sight, but inside, and she was also shot, and her body was seen to be dragged back inside. So the police started shooting into the crawl spaces. Eventually, all six members of the SLA were killed Donald DeFries, Angela Atwood, Camilla Hall, Ms. Moon Soltisic, Nancy Ling Perry, and Willie Wolf. It was later found that there was a gas can which was bullet ridden and leaking that with the tear gas grenade caused the fire. It was probably the longest and most intense shootout in the city's history. Thousands of rounds were fired from both sides, 18 weapons were recovered from the fire, two unexploded pipe bombs and 23 surrounding houses were damaged. But miraculously, no police officers or bystanders were injured at all. I mean, that's a good thing, but I thought they were going to gun ranges to learn how to shoot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they had uh, more bullets. And yeah, anyway. <laughs> they had guns that they um, tweaked to shoot faster as well, didn't they? Yeah. And they had like bombs in there that could have exploded and caused so much more damage. But I mean, it just goes to show how committed to their cause they were because they could have just surrendered. I mean, DeFries probably didn't want to because he never wanted to go back to prison again. But it's like, was it worth it leaving your, your kids behind for that? Yeah, I, I don't understand it. But then I'm not uh, a revolutionary. <laughs> I'm not... Yeah. Uh, you know, a very political person, so. Yeah. Well, I am, but there's a line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm getting shot at, I'm not, you know, yeah. Well, firstly, I wouldn't start a, a militant group, that's for sure. And hopefully we'll never be brainwashed into joining one. Touch wood. <laughs> <laughs> so five of the bodies were initially found. And until the sixth one was found, like people were speculating if that one was Patricia. The sixth body wasn't found until the next day. And the coroner confirmed that it was not Patricia Hurst. But then the police knew that she was still alive and the hunt was on for her, Bill and Emily. The remaining SLA members waited two weeks before going back to Berkeley. The car that they had bought to make their journey happened to break down in front of the house of people they knew. So they knocked on the, on the door of these friends and these friends fed them and gave them money. On the 7th of June, 1974, Patricia, she wanted to do a eulogy to remember the six comrades who had been killed and the communique was shared with the media. And in this eulogy, she refers to them by their nicknames, which at this time I can't remember what they were, but she kind of has a sentence for each one, like describing them. And she describes Willie as being like the most beautiful man she's ever loved and gushes over him. At this time, the trio got help from Kathy Solia and her boyfriend, Jim Kilgore, who was Angela's friends. Kathy introduced them to Jack Scott, who was a sports editor. He agreed to help them escape Berkeley, and he drove Patricia to New York himself. Before the drive, according to Bill, he did give her an opportunity to quit with the SLA, but she just ordered him to keep driving. In the New York apartment, 
Mickey Scott, who was who's Jack's partner, she got the New York Times for Patricia at her request, and Patricia would circle names which she said were for the SLA hit list. Jack then went back to get Bill, and another friend of theirs went to get Emily. Mickey and Jack rented a farmhouse in Pennsylvania for the group to move to. It gave them a space to hide and to just breathe and be themselves. Another wanted leftist terrorist called Wendy Masako Yoshimura joined them as Jack had helped her when she was wanted. According to Bill, Wendy and Patricia got on very well. So Jack suggested creating a book about the SLA. A, to help them get money as they were running out of resources, and B, to help people understand them and their cause. They started recording tapes and making transcriptions, but then Bill decided that the book was no longer a good idea. So they destroyed the tapes, and this angered Jack, who by this point had had enough of them. He agreed to drive Patricia to Las Vegas, but not all the way back to California. Bill and Emily had to make their own way back. On the way to Las Vegas, Jack and Patricia were stopped for speeding, but managed to get away. Patricia was then left in a motel for two days by herself while she waited for the others. Jim Kilgore then picked her up and took her to Sacramento. In Sacramento, the new group members came together and the new group was made up of Bill, Emily, Patricia, Wendy Yoshimura, Kathy Salia, Steve Salia, who was Kathy's brother, Jim Kilgore and Mike Borton. And then Patricia and Steve Salia developed a relationship. About Patricia being in the motel for two days, like she had the opportunity then to escape. Yeah. She's been she's had, from what I can remember, three opportunities to escape. So the first one being the male's sporting goods when she's left in the van by herself. Yeah. And then when Jack gave her a way out, he was giving her a lift to wherever it was. Yeah. And then being left in the motel for two days. Jack's brother, Walter Scott, apparently he had problems with alcohol. He got drunk one day and informed the FBI that he believed Patricia was staying in the farmhouse in Pennsylvania. The FBI searched the home and even though the SLA had cleaned the house before leaving, they found a piece of newspaper which had Wendy's fingerprints. And this was the first time the FBI linked Wendy to Patricia Hurst. The FBI also realised the Salias were involved as they had visited Wendy's ex-boyfriend in prison. Jack Scott then started talking to an editor from the Rolling Stone about the SLA. The FBI then got in contact with the Rolling Stone and as a result, Jack and Mickey met Patricia's father. According to Mickey, Patricia's father wasn't surprised that she had joined the group as he knew that she was always a rebel. At this point, Russ Little and Joe Romero were sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Marcus Foster. On the 21st of April in 1975, the SLA carried out another bank robbery, which was the Carmichael bank robbery. They chose this bank as it had no electronic security. And before going in, I think this was according to Mike Borton. They had difficulty deciding how to carry out the robbery. Emily's shotgun safety was off and according to Mike, due to her nervousness, she ended up shooting a customer who was Myrna Opsal. At the time, the group were yelling and cocking their guns. According to a bank employee, there was a pregnant lady who was also beaten up and she very sadly lost her baby as a result of this. When the SLA fled, the bank employees were left to take care of Myrna while they waited for emergency services. After she was taken away, the same employees had to clean up the blood. Mrs. Opsal's husband was a surgeon and he was there when she was brought into hospital and he had to be told by his colleagues to stop trying to resuscitate her because it was too late. Patricia drove the getaway car and under the felony murder rule, as she was an accomplice, she was equally guilty for the murder. And this is quite crucial later on as well. Myrna Opsal's murder remained unsolved for 27 years. After the robbery and the murder of Opsal, the SLA moved back to San Francisco. Patricia and Steve began living as a couple 
the group started to then make bombs as their new form of activism. On one occasion, according to Mike, the group were toying around with pipe bombs. They went inside for lunch and a fire started in the backyard. Apparently, the fire department came in to put the fire out and while they did, they didn't notice the guns or Patricia Hurst on the premises and they just kind of did their job and walked back out. (laughs) I guess they're not really trained to look for those things. Yeah, maybe. Or they're just thinking, got to put the fire out. Yeah. But also, when they put the fire out, wouldn't they have seen the materials for a pipe bomb? You would think so, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a strange one. Yeah, it is. So on the 7th of August, Patricia went to a police station and placed a bomb under a police car. However, it was a dud and never went off. On the 20th of August, the group had another bomb plan, this time at the Marine County Courthouse. The plan was to have one bomb go off under a law enforcement vehicle to create panic and then a second at the doorway to cause fatalities. The bombs did go off, however, in the wrong order and therefore no one was harmed. Then two days later, a large pipe bomb was placed under a police car in Hollywood. The bomb was designed to detonate when the officers were sat in the car and the car was moving. Fortunately, the trigger didn't match and the bomb didn't go off. But when the bomb was discovered, all police officers were instructed to check their cars. One other officer found a second bomb. The bombs were filled with pins and shrapnel, which could have caused a number of deaths. And in the CNN documentary, Bill has this weird moment where he's like, I I didn't have anything to do with the bombs. Don't ask me about the bombs. (laughs) He just has this weird moment of denial. Yeah. (laughs) Which mm, sounds a bit dodge. (laughs) Yeah, everything that man says sounds a bit dodge. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll share our thoughts on him. Yeah. On the 18th of September 1975, to find Patricia, the FBI focused their efforts on Kathleen Solia, as she was the link between Wendy and Patricia. Wendy had allegedly rented a house, inside of which there was paraphernalia linked to one of the bombings, so she was being charged as an accomplice. The FBI managed to find a woman who was linked to Kathleen, Patricia Jean McCarthy. They started a surveillance on her, which led them to an apartment complex. When the FBI then interviewed the person running the complex, he confirmed that Jim, Mike, Steve and the two sisters were working in the apartment. The FBI then found out that the group was stealing power from another location. During the surveillance, they saw who they expected to come out, but then they also saw Bill and Emily. Bill went to the laundromat where he saw a man who he suspected to be a police officer. The next day, he and Emily tried to flee from the apartment, but they were arrested. Police removed an assortment of explosives and at least one pipe bomb which was ready for use. The guy that came into the laundromat, he was in like a full-on suit and not someone that usually frequented a laundromat in that kind of area. Yeah, he just looked really out of place. Yeah. Which is a bit silly. Yeah, and then he decided to grab for the payphone inside the laundromat to call his colleagues. Yeah, he went over to the payphone while after seeing Bill. But then this is all according to Bill. Uh, Yes, that's true. (laughs) They then went to the other address, which was under surveillance, where they found Wendy and Patricia. Patricia started running towards the bedroom where the guns were. However, a police officer pointed a gun to Wendy's head threatening to shoot her if Patricia didn't come back. Steve Solia was also arrested. Mike, Kathleen and Josephine were not found and were still underground. Patricia was arrested along with Bill and Emily. When being booked by the police officer and asked for her occupation, Patricia apparently replied, Urban Gorilla. F. Lee Bailey and his sidekick, Al Johnson, became Patricia's defence attorneys. Bailey was a celebrity attorney. He had taken on high-profile cases such as being a defence attorney for one of the suspects in the Boston Strangler murders. On the 18th of October 1975, a recording between Patricia and her cousin Austin Hurst shows Patricia saying she found Bailey to be patronising, but that she thought Al Johnson was nice. She wrote love letters to Steve Solia 
where she says she wants to fight for the revolution and overthrow the US government. Bailey and Johnson reminded Patricia that she was to have no contact with the SLA. They argued she was traumatised and it took months to deprogram and de-radicalise her. Bill Harris argued that Patricia was in turn brainwashed by her lawyers. Her ex fiance Stephen Weed, wanted to see her, but she did not want to see him. In the courtroom, Patricia was made over with a nice brown pantsuit, nail polish, and her hair was done. So completely different to how she looked when she was arrested. Yeah, they basically wanted to just make her look all pretty and not dishevelled. And... Like she had money. Yeah, like she had money and that she wasn't a radical left-wing revolutionary. Yeah. In the American criminal justice system, at the time, brainwashing could not be used as a defence. The defence put forward was coercive persuasion in Patty Hearst's case, i.e. she was forced to commit her crimes and was therefore not guilty. David Bancroft of the US Attorney's Office was assigned to cross-examine the defence experts and put on the government's experts. The defence had chosen three psychiatrists, Jolion West, Robert Lifton and Martin Orne, all of whom had speciality in brainwashing. Robert Lifton had researched prisoners of war who expressed sympathy with their captors after years of confinement. Jolian West wrote the script for her defence. No matter which way the evidence was going, she argued she was being co- coercively persuaded. Bailey argued that the SLA had knowledge of brainwashing as de Vries had studied the North Korean methodology and he abused Patricia enough to the point she would do anything she was told to do. Bill Harris argued they weren't brainwashers and had no such training to be able to do so. Bailey decided to put Patricia on the stand. In her affidavit, Patricia's version of events states that when she was kidnapped, she was kept in a closet on the floor. She was in a state of fear and terror. When she had her blindfold removed, she felt as if she were on an LSD trip. She claimed her involvement in the Hibernia bank robbery was as a hostage, threatened to play her part, after which she was told that she was guilty of robbery and murder and would be shot by the FBI on sight. She lived in a fog, confused and unable to distinguish between reality and fantasy. Patricia claimed that she was raped by DeFries and Willie and that she hated Willie. However, There was a tape recording where Patricia declared her love for Willie and called him the most gentlest and most beautiful man. At the same time, she was kept in a closet blindfolded for a significant amount of time before she first had sex with Willie, which could be argued as rape. The SLA argued that with so many women in the group who were feminists, they would not have allowed Patricia to be raped. Yet it could be argued what feminists would kidnap a 19-year-old woman. Also, the group had fluid sexuality, so they might not have seen it as rape. Bill and Emily gave an interview to New Times magazine. The journalist confronted them about the accusation of rape. Emily argued that Patricia was so in love with Willie, she carried a charm that he had given her as a token of his love, an old Nick monkey. When Patricia was arrested, this was found in her purse, but no one knew the significance of it. The US attorneys found the necklace from the evidence room and they also found the one found on Willie's body when he had died. The evidence was one of the last exhibits put in front of the jury. Bailey said the reason he put Patricia on the stand was that they had a ruling from the judge that the cross-examination should be limited to just the bank robbery and kidnapping. However, the judge never ruled this and the prosecution were entitled to ask whatever they wanted. This put Patricia at risk of answering questions about the death of Myrna Opsahl, which could link her to the death penalty. Patricia was instructed to take the Fifth Amendment. However, this suggested to the jury that she had something to hide. That's where she could say, like, no comment, right? She didn't have to answer the questions. Yeah, or like, I take the Fifth Amendment, or whatever it is they say. Mm -hmm. Following an eight-week trial, Patricia was sentenced to seven years in prison for her participation in the Hibernia bank robbery. Bailey described the case as the worst he had ever taken on and that Patricia was more unpopular than the Boston Strangler. Her arrest shocked people as people didn't expect someone as wealthy as a hearse to do jail time for a bank robbery, but it showed money couldn't always buy you out of jail. 
However, the judge allowed her to be released on a $1 million bail. Another condition of her bail was that she would be protected at her family's own cost. So her family hired Bernard Shaw, who was a former San Francisco police officer turned bodyguard, and he was a family man. Patricia ended up having an affair with him. While on bail, the charge for the Mel Sporting Goods store still remained. On the 9th of August 1976, Bill and Emily Harris were found guilty of kidnapping and robbery of the sporting goods store. They were convicted to a six-year term. With pressure from the hearse, the judge who was familiar with the evidence and thought Patricia was guilty of the same charges, plus assault with a deadly weapon, was removed. Patricia got five years on probation. Her class privilege started to come through. Then they wanted to convict someone for her kidnapping. However, the people responsible for her kidnapping were dead. Bill and Emily were offered the opportunity to plead life without possibility of parole if they agreed to take responsibility, which of course they refused. There was pressure from the hearse not to prosecute as it would draw Patricia into it as a witness. Bill and Emily agreed to a 10-year sentence including the three they had already served while in custody. They actually benefited from the hearse's efforts to keep Patricia out of further litigation. The next concern was the Carmichael bank robbery where Myrna Opsahl was murdered. During the Hibernian bank robbery trial, the FBI agent that was in charge of the case at the time offered Patricia immunity for other circumstances if she made herself available as a witness to the FBI. Stephen Solia was originally charged in the Federal District of Sacramento for the robbery because of eyewitnesses claiming he was there. Patricia told the true events of the incident which revealed Stephen was not in the bank. The prosecutors wanted to stick with the eyewitness identification, even if Patricia was telling the truth. However, Stephen was acquitted. The federal government wanted to use the trial as a test run to see if they could prove the murder of Myrna. However, the trial went horribly. Even though all of the evidence was consistent with Patricia's story, they weren't sure if they could rely on her. At the end of the day, Bailey and Johnson got what they wanted. Immunity for Patricia, which meant she could not be prosecuted for Myrna's murder. She had gone from kidnap victim to urban guerrilla and then to state witness. The Supreme Court refused to hear her appeal for the Hibernia bank robbery and she was surrendered at the federal prison in Pleasanton, California. George Martinez was brought on to the case. Then Patricia fired Bailey and Johnson. Johnson had even found divorce lawyers for Bernard Shaw so he could divorce his wife and marry Patricia. Johnson and Bailey were upset, especially as they had successfully got her out of a murder charge. The press reported that Patricia was asking for a new trial, charging her former attorneys for ineffective defence. However, her motion was rejected. Patricia then started doing interviews to change public opinion and get Jimmy Carter to commute to her sentence. Since her family ran a media empire, the money, the connections and influence, this was easy to do. However, they had a helping hand from something unexpected. The Jonestown Massacre in 1978, where 900 people lost their lives in Guyana because they followed a preacher, brought into question how a charismatic person could persuade people to act against their own self-interests. This played very nicely into Patricia's argument. As a result of this, on the 1st of February 1979, after 22 months in prison, Patricia's sentence was commuted by President Carter. In 1981, Russ Little was retried and acquitted for the murder of Marcus Foster. Romero, to this day I believe, still remains in prison. Patricia published an autobiography called Every Secret Thing. In her book, she admits to being involved in the two bank robberies. She also claims that Emily Harris called Myrna Opsahl a bourgeois pig. Bailey commented in the CNN documentary that the book was the dumbest thing he had seen in his life because, and this is a quote from him, immunity does not cover writing books to make money about how you committed a capital crime and being a getaway driver in a bank where murder occurs makes the driver liable for the murder in the first degree. Even though the book contained details which could lead to evidence, nothing was done. Carter had only commuted Patricia for the bank robbery 
not the murder charge. Patricia continued doing TV interviews. A movie was made about her. She even acted in movies herself. She focused so much on the bank robbery that everyone forgot about the other incidents, including the Mel's Sporting Goods store incident, the bomb plots, and Myrna Opsal's murder. And, you know, given that her family own a media empire, she probably had the best PR you could get to help. Her family would have had all the media connections, wouldn't they? Yeah. They owned most of the newspapers, I'm guessing. Yeah, they would have had it. They owned newspapers and they would have had influence and, yeah, connections. So lucky for her. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I imagine if she wasn't the person she was, she would have got charged for a lot more and, and they wouldn't have been so lenient. Yeah. So in 1999, a former LACO prosecutor, Michael Latin, was handed a file on Kathleen Salaya, who had been a fugitive since 1975. She'd been hiding for 24 years, so the case was no longer a priority compared to other murder cases. Didn't she change her name? Yeah, so they find her on the 16th of June in 1995. The Minnesota Fugitive Task Force found her living under the name of Sarah Jane Olson and she was raising her children and acting in the in her community you know like being in the community theater just living her life being a mum basically yeah and then she was arrested however the prosecutors realized that the jurors would have no idea who the SLA were as it had been over two decades They looked at the other crimes the SLA had committed and realised then that no one had actually been prosecuted for the murder of Myrna Opsal. On the 21st of January 2001, Bill Clinton, near the end of his presidency, signed last-minute pardons, and on that list was Patricia Hurst. Now, going back to your comment about had she been someone else... Like, she wouldn't have gotten away with this. Mm. I couldn't help thinking about Leslie Van Houten, who has just recently been released from prison at the age of 70. She was 19 when she committed her crimes under the influence of Charles Manson. And yeah, the crimes are slightly different and the circumstances are different. But, you know, Leslie served her time. She had various like parole hearings throughout her sentence before they deemed her safe to be released in society. Patty, under American law, was still involved in a murder and she was involved in all the bomb plots and she's just gotten away with it. Uh, um, I guess the difference is when Leslie was arrested, she was still a hardcore Charles Manson follower. And it took years and years to rehabilitate her and deprogram her. Whereas Patty, she just kind of flipped as, you know, quite easily. I say flipped. She changed her tune quite quickly. But at the end of the day, she was still involved in those crimes. I'm guessing that she knew Bill Clinton as well due to her family ties. Maybe. Well, her mother did work for Ronald Reagan. Yeah, that's true. Her grandfather was a politician. Yeah, so they probably had some strings that they could pull. Yeah. On the 16th of January 2002, Bill was arrested for the murder of Myrna Opsal. After he was released from prison in 1983, he became an investigator for lawyers. He and Emily divorced in some time between 86 and 87 as she was in love with a long term girlfriend. Remember, they were in an open relationship. Bill remarried and had two sons. And then of course he was arrested again for Myrna's murder. Patricia was not indicted like the other SLA members, nor did she testify. Mike Bortin, before his arrest in 2003, he married Kathy Salaya's sister and started a small business in Oregon. After serving her prison sentence for kidnapping, Emily became a successful computer consultant for various Hollywood studios. However, she was never charged in relation to any of the bombings. On the 14th of February 2003, Mike Bortin, Bill Harris, Emily Harris and Kathy Salaya pleaded guilty to the murder of Myrna Opsal in 1975. Emily admitted to pulling the trigger by accident and was sentenced to eight years in prison. Kathy Salaya was released later on in 2009. 
Jim Kilgore, Kathy Slyer's boyfriend from the 70s, was captured in South Africa in 2002 after 30 years on the run. He was released in 2009. He went on to become a teacher at the University of Illinois. Wendy Yoshimura served six months in prison for explosives and weapons charges. She became an artist after release. Josephine Slyer was never charged for any crimes, and Stephen Slyer continued painting houses until he passed away in 2013. Patricia, she started raising dogs for dog shows, and she has won multiple awards. Her and Bernard Shaw remained married, and they had two daughters together, and then he passed away in 2013. As mentioned earlier, it was suggested that Patricia was brainwashed by the SLA and that her case was a good example of Stockholm Syndrome. It was actually within the FBI that the term Stockholm Syndrome was coined by a police psychologist, Dr Harvey Schlossberg. He helped create the world's first hostage negotiation programme. He coined the term to help cops understand what went on in the Stockholm incident. Stockholm Syndrome has been defined to have stages. Initially, the captive forms a certain bond with the abductor. Subsequently, the assailant returns the feelings to the extent of desiring the captive's survival. Ultimately, both the captor and captives become wary of the police and those in positions of authority. In the 1980s, studies revealed the syndrome's rarity absent in about 92% of hostage incidents, to which Dr. Beirut, the, the psychiatrist who helped the police in the credit banking robbery in the previous episode, he said that the syndrome only occurs under certain conditions. But half a century on, and Stockholm Syndrome is still referred to in the media and by the public when reporting or talking about high-profile hostage incidents or kidnappings. There have been very few academic studies on the phenomenon, and it's not part of any classification systems within psychiatry at all, making it more of a media phenomenon than a psychiatric diagnosis. There's also a gender bias. Feminist psychologist Hannah Olson says that Stockholm Syndrome focuses on weak-willed women in relationship with strong men. Dr. Beirut never treated Kristin Enmark, who was the hostage at Credit Mankin, but he nevertheless made statements about her mental health during the traumatic experience. Yeah, and I think in the case of Patty Hearst, well, firstly, in the CNN documentary, there was an argument that Patty wasn't experiencing Stockholm Syndrome. And the person who argued this, they said that Stockholm Syndrome is like, you've got me, I'm a captive, and not, I really dig what you're doing, which is what Patty Hearst was argued to have done when she became an active comrade. And, you know, she it's a tricky one because she was kidnapped and she did have more than one relationship with the SLA members. But at the same time, if you go back to the theory that it's weak-willed women in relationship with strong men, the SLA were mostly made up of women, so... Yeah, I get that point. Yeah. In the case of the bank drama in Stockholm in 1973, it's not surprising that the hostages saw Jana Erik Olsen and Clark Olofsson as the safer option. The police's actions, like the poorly thought-out plans of rescue mistaking the identity of the perpetrator and not listening or speaking to the hostages further cemented the idea that the hostages could rely more on the criminals than the law enforcement and government agencies. We covered the Norman's Tory robbery in our previous episode, so go and listen to it if you haven't already. Recently, there was a thread on Twitter which talked about Stockholm Syndrome in relation to domestic violence and it cited portions from Jess Hill's book, See What You Made Me Do, Power, Control and Domestic Abuse. She comments in an article on the Independent website that we shouldn't presume that victims are crazy just because they behave in certain ways. And she says, but instead, just by telling that story and showing how authority can just literally make something up on the spot to excuse itself, it's like a shorthand for people to understand how so many other things that we've come to believe could be wrong. She also comments that Stockholm Syndrome shows 
how easy it is to just establish a syndrome based on no diagnostic criteria at all and to never even have diagnostic criteria developed, ever. And that's the end of that. Yeah, so what do we make of all that, Ben? I'm not sure about both Patricia Hurst and this Bill Harris. Yeah. I I can't say that she's innocent and I can't say that she's guilty and I I can't say like well nobody can say if she was raped or not because I, the only people that know that are her and the the rapists and any evidence that existed at the time yeah which they obviously don't have yeah yeah it's a very difficult one and I just wonder you know she obviously had this very wealthy lifestyle and then she gets kidnapped which would have been traumatic for anyone but then I I want like part of me wonders was it that she just had this kind of slice of adventure and this slice of you know living a different life before being returned back to normality with her family knowing that she could face no consequences do you think she was being a rebel like her father said that she was it's hard to say I, th- I don't think it's right that she got away with the crimes in the way that she did because even though she was kidnapped and that was against her will she still committed those crimes you know one person died at least and other people could have very well died if their bomb plots didn't fail and you know like everyone else they got to live their lives for 27 years before they got arrested which in itself is a, like, were they really remorseful if they were happy to live? Yeah, right. 27 years while um, Myrna Opsal's family had to live 27 years without any justice. Her poor son as well. Yeah, when, when she died, he was a teenager. So he had to go through all of the rest of his teenage years, all the way into adulthood, not getting any justice for his mum. But I think it's also, if it's true that Ms. Moon and Nancy and DeFries were the ones that killed uh, Marcus Foster and shot his, his colleague, it's also quite sad that Russ Little and Joe Ramirez were arrested and one of them is still in prison for a crime he technically didn't commit. But then maybe because everyone else was killed in that shootout, they just wanted someone to pay for that crime. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It is. And it doesn't help the fact that, you know, she's from a very wealthy family who, you know, don't want this situation to ruin their reputation and whatnot. They've got connections which worked in their favour. It caused her parents to separate in the end, though, didn't it? Yeah, it did. The stress of the whole situation, it ruined their relationship. Yeah, which, guess shouldn't come as a surprise. No. And also, you know... She had four relationships in that time. She had her, well, if you can call it a relationship with Willie and Stephen, but, you know, she was with her ex-fiancé, then it was Willie, whether that was consensual or not. Then it was Stephen, whether, Steve Celia, sorry, whether that was consensual or not. And then she ends up having an affair with her bodyguard. And we have to remember she was really young at this point. Like she was 19 when she was kidnapped. She was probably very naive, but they all were. They were all very young. It is easy to believe that the rich white girl got away with it. And maybe that is the case. But at the same time, you know, if she was like horribly abused. Well, that's it. The only person that knows what that feels like is the person that that went through it or a a person that has gone through something similar. Mm. As a person that hasn't had that experience, fortunately, I don't know if I can say that she's innocent or guilty. It's just a strange set of circumstances that, yeah, you just can't judge, I think. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it sounds like there was a lot happening during that time because you had the Boston Strangler who was a serial killer or a group of serial killers. And then there's the zebra murders, which I knew nothing about. Yeah, I didn't know anything about those. So yeah, it sounds like there was a lot happening. And the Jonestown massacre. Yep, the Jonestown, which I, I did know about. Absolutely horrendous, horrendous situation, which played into her argument. So yeah. Our conclusion is we don't really have a conclusion, but we would love to hear 
people's thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, please let us know. We've got a contact us page on the website, so. Yeah. So, next episode, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're going to cover Portugal's first serial killer. Yeah. So we're going to go even way back further in time. Yeah, we're out of the 70s and into the 1800s. And his name is Diogo Alves. Yeah. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. You should probably start by learning how to pronounce the names. <laughs> yeah. Now we've got to learn Portuguese. Yeah. No, Portuguese should be all right. But yeah, this one's an interesting one. Yeah. So join us for that one, folks. Yeah. If you want to go back further in time and go to a different country, join us. <laughs> Please download and subscribe with us wherever you get your podcasts. And let us know what you thought of this episode. Thank you for listening to the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find more information about the show on our website at feloniuspod.com or on our Instagram at feloniuspod. Links to our show notes can be found in the episode description as well as through our website and social media. You can visit our contact us page and tell us what you think about the show and if there are any cases you would like us to cover. We hope you join us for the next episode. Goodbye. Bye.